Hi, I'm Carl Segno, and you're watching the Open Source News. We're back with the second half of our interview with Boris Kramsov, where on the shores of Burrard Inlet in the freezing cold snow, so rare to Vancouver, we'll be talking about Canada's native populations as well as the resilience of the homeless in the face of economic crisis. Right, now some of the information we've been getting about homelessness and uh, native populations mm -hmm. came from a report on a town in northern Ontario called Sioux Lookout. Yep. We'll add the URL to find that report. It's very good. It's just a case study, but it's well done. Mm -hmm. um, and the link there was between kind of the abuses in residential schools and a legacy of homelessness and that kind of thing. I want yeah. you to talk about that, but before you do, just, just give me a sense of how you've come in contact with Native communities and that kind of thing. You know, if you actually are willing to go out of your way to look for them, or you're willing to even be open to them, then they are more or less everywhere you go. And so, if you are actually willing, I mean, there's heaps in BC if you go traveling anywhere. If you go to a lot of the parks, they're positioned, a lot of them are positioned near uh, Native communities. In Yukon, the entirety of Yukon is divided up between like six or seven First Nations groups. Ontario has lots of them. Yep. In uh, Nova Scotia, there's uh, in uh, Newfoundland, there's the obvious one, the Micmac. There's plenty of others. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of uh, most of them. So yeah, you know, they're literally present everywhere you go. And of course, as soon as you get to like Nab Labrador and uh, Nunavut and places like that, there's you know the Inuit people. I mean, that's a pretty huge group right there. So they're everywhere. Okay, but how, how did you come in contact with them? Uh, you know, it started out pretty early. I more or less always have been pretty open to meeting new interesting people. And uh, for example, uh, doing a lot of trips in BC, you come across people like that. Uh, my parents uh, live these days pretty close to a Katsi reserve. Um, when I was in Yukon, I worked in uh, well for a hunting uh, outfit, and uh, they employed a couple of the uh, uh, a couple of guys there. The one I worked with uh, specifically, uh, he was uh, Tesla and Plinket. And uh, then while traveling across Canada, you know, you meet them in cars in Alberta. There's plenty of reserves when traveling through there. In uh, Nova Scotia, I got around Truro, there's a pretty big reserve, you know, I met a couple of really interesting people there. Newfoundland, not as much, actually, but as soon as you get to Labrador, they're a pretty big chunk of the population. So, you know, it's, okay, so after a certain point, it's more surprising if you don't meet them, to be you, you, You've seen quite a wide sampling of Canada's native communities then. Do they well, share some. in common an experience of the residential school abuses? What do you think the impact of that is? You know, I'd say that Residential schools, in a lot of ways, is what united a lot of the First Nations communities in misery. <laughs> and that is really, really horrible and sad, and it is seemingly the case, in that you hear a lot of reviews from people about how residential schools really screwed up their family, their community, or themselves. Uh, because what happened is, the Canadian government uh, decided that the way to integrate these First Nations uh, kids from the communities into the Canadian society is to give them a proper Canadian residential education. And we're not talking ancient history here, we're talking stuff that was still going on in the 1970s. So this is pretty recent. And uh, Like so the what Alberta do, Eugenics Board that was going on then in the 1970s too. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's one of the biggest mistakes, I think, about studying this in history classes alone is that we have this feeling that this is somehow removed from us by the past. So, these kids were taken away into these, uh, and they were, they were supposed to be taught these uh, industrial jobs in Canada. Uh, that didn't work out most of the time. They were beaten for using their native languages. They were forced to work jobs that had very little relevance. Like, they were, often enough, they were used as basically slave labor. Uh, some of them document a lot of abuse that, were, that went on in this as well. And uh, the sad thing is that when you, that when they came back, they lacked all the skills that they would actually need to live like their parents and their grandparents lived. Now, there's, there's kind of a precedent in history for 
states, especially large territorial states, to maltreat, shall we say, ethnic minorities, uh, especially indigenous peoples, or what we can call fourth world peoples, stateless and indigenous groups. Um, in, in places like Kazakhstan, we saw the Soviets try and settle nomads. In places like Tunisia, the post-independence government did the same kind of program trying to settle the Berbers, and, and, and China does it too, with, with compulsory education that forces them to take up in cities and stuff. Do you see this as a kind of a parallel in Canada to, to those cases overseas? There's a lot of parallels, without a doubt. I mean, even with my personal uh, heritage, I guess, uh, I'm Russian, by the way, if you didn't guess by the name Boris, got to Canada about 10 years ago. Uh, in Soviet Russia, they were doing the very much similar thing, residential schools and uh, urban education for uh, the northern people specifically. And the results were really well matched to what the Canadian experience is. Like people completely disconnected from their culture, disconnected at the same time from the mainstream culture. And you know what? It was, uh, in retrospect, brought up numerous times about how the Soviet Union mistreated the First Nations people there. And of course it did. Without a doubt. Uh, and the thing is, Canada is no different. Everyone is doing this. Everyone was doing this. The one place where Canada perhaps was different is that it, did not, it either went too far or not far enough. A lot of these kids, they did not get enough knowledge and experience to actually work in a Canadian society because they were basically institutionalized for a big chunk of their early life in this residential school system. And at the same time it went too far in the sense that first off they got institutionalized again and uh, it went too far from what they actually were as people. And so what you have is as a lot of the elders describe actually even in CEO report in CEO lookout report that comes through loud and clear they call them lost souls. They have left really that ability to live off the land that their parents and grandparents had and that fierce independence and just being able to just live without anything just relying on yourself and at the same time they have not gone far enough or low enough or high enough whatever you want to call it they want to get close enough uh, by the dint of the way that the system worked to actually being able to be successful in the Canadian society at large When I was shooting this video, I thought it would be 8 minutes long. It turns out it's about 16 minutes long, which is about twice as long as we're allowed to make a video and post it on YouTube. So at this point, we are going to have to cut the video in half. Please join us for the fourth and final part of our interview with Boris Khamsov here on the Open Source News.